There's something there's happening. There's commotion. There's Let's cameras. There's someone's book cover on the wall. <laughs> And uh, yeah, let's go. Yeah, that's uh, that's about the size of it. No, I'm sure you're very excited. I'm very excited. I love this book. I love Rob. Uh, we were going to start tonight um, with uh, Rob was going to read a passage uh, from his book, and I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, be real brief. Uh, and the, basically, this story is about when I jumped off the Manhattan Bridge in 1999. And I'm going to start in the middle. As you said that I spilled water. <laughs> um, the only thing I could do wrong. I came home from work in a shift at the Atlantic Grill on the Upper East Side in 1999. And my roommate, Kiosh, told me that uh, he met a guy who was going to help him jump off the Manhattan Bridge with a bungee cord. So I said, let's go. And so here we are. About 15 people were gathered on a busy corner of Flatbush Avenue waiting for the guy with the rope. For something wholly illegal and intrinsically dangerous, it was a rather well-advertised operation. <clears throat> After a few minutes, Tony arrived and led us along Flatbush Avenue toward the on-ramp to the bridge. As we traveled, Tony gave us instructions, including the order to lie down if the subway passed us on the bridge so the conductors wouldn't see us. Tony had me carry the bungee cord up the bridge in a big bag. It weighed maybe 50 pounds, and I told myself its substantial weight meant that it must be really safe. <laughs> when we'd covered some distance, he handed out walkie-talkies set to the police frequency to a few of the customers. He'd asked us to give him $20 a piece. He told us to listen for any, large, for any discussion among the cops about a large group of people sneaking out onto the Manhattan Bridge with crazy gear. He said that it'd be hard to get away if they wanted to arrest us, so what we were really listening for was any mention of Truck 2 or Truck 6. He said that those names referred to tactical anti-terrorist units that would kill us first and then figure out who we were. He said if we heard that those groups were being sent to the bridge, we should just drop everything, run, and not stop until we were in New Jersey. I listened very carefully for Trucks 2 and Truck 6 for the next few hours. We walked out over the East River, hitting the deck whenever a train came by, and made it about one-eighth of a mile from the Brooklyn shore, then set up our station. Our first instructions from Tony were to climb down a level on the bridge and, I swear to God, disable the red lights that hang from the bridge to alert airplanes. Hello, I am a bridge. I'm sure that today, after 9-11, New York law enforcement would truck six your ass off for that stunt, but our adventure took place two years prior to the attack, so we didn't imagine anyone would be too upset that we were turning a piece of vital metropolitan infrastructure into an amusement park ride and <laughs> making it partially invisible to air traffic. Then Tony, who claimed to be a theatrical rigger, took out the bungee cord and secured it to something. To what? To a piece of bridge, I guess. I have no idea. Tony then asked who wanted to go first, and a short guy with a buzz cut volunteered. Before he let the test subject jump, Tony thrust a tape recorder in the guy's face. I'm going to skip that guy's jump, because who cares about him? And we're going to go ahead to mine. What is your name? Rob Delaney. I must point out that Kiosh made fun of me without interruption for several years at how much naked fear was audible in my shaky, high-pitched voice as I answered Tony's questions. What are you about to do? Jump off the Manhattan Bridge. Are you doing this of your own volition? Yes. Jump. I jumped. I looked out over a sleepy, twinkling Manhattan as I plummeted into the night. It was wonderful and visceral, like my mind and body were violently wiped clean and rebooted to take in the majesty of the experience. It felt like a reverse birth as I flew into and through the darkness toward the river. Then the slack in the cord tightened as my rocketing mass stretched it to its limit, and I shot skyward and bridgeward almost as fast as I'd descended. I made it almost to the bridge, then fell again and began a series of bounces. It was like being in a giant glitter globe as the city's lights shook around me. I felt entirely buoyed and supported and loved by the dirty river, the ugly bridge, the beautiful city, and the questionable rope. Then Tony threw down the yank em up rope, and after it swung past me a few times, I was able to grab it, hook it to my waist, and get pulled back to the bridge by my fellow jumpers. Then Kiyosh and the others jumped, one by one, and we pulled them back up. We packed up as the sun rose and took the train home to Alphabet City to sleep, arriving in full daylight. 
It had been entirely magnificent to watch about 20 people in a row have an experience you knew they'd talk about for the rest of their lives and participate in it as well. It was interesting to see the few people who backed out so totally at peace with their decision, too. Nobody gave them a hard time, either. I know I thought, of course you wouldn't want to jump off a bridge. Why would anyone do that? That'd be crazy. Those of us who had jumped were pretty much aglow. As my reflections began to gather and coalesce in my brain, I was absolutely glad I'd done it, but knew I'd never do it again. Nor would I allow a loved one, or really anyone, to do it, since I'd seen how ramshackle an operation it was. It was a singular rush and an extraordinary, terrible idea all at once. And while I have difficulty imagining a scenario where I'd do something that reckless again, I'm very happy to say I jumped off, I'm very happy I can say I jumped off the Manhattan Bridge, and you, statistically, cannot. Let me start by asking, uh, when you jumped off the bridge, were you thinking, wait till I write this in my book? <laughs> That's an awesome <laughs> question. Certainly not. Certainly not. I'm still in low-grade medical shock that I wrote a book yeah. and then that it got published. That's insane. So, no. Wow. Well, you know, we have a strange, uh, strangely formed relationship. We became friends on Twitter. We did. Which is rare... Is anyone, has anyone else made friends? Raise your hand if you've made friends on Twitter. And you know it's strange. It's an odd thing, right? And, uh, yeah, and then eventually we, we corresponded for at least a year, and then eventually we were like, let's meet uh, in person. Yeah, we had a lunch date. And then it was, uh, it was a letdown because <laughs> it was not, you know, it, were, it wasn't these tightly compact comedic bits i know yeah no, moments we bored each other yeah yeah we haven't done it since <laughs> <laughs> no but uh it's so it's very strange it's it, it's an odd do you have that a lot with people where you where I, you make friends with people who I, you just know on twitter yeah i have made friends on twitter and i think twitter's better for making friends than any social network that preceded it because you do really have to distill sort of your purest essence into that little 140 character box so like on Facebook, where you can have like a million pictures and be like, this is the carefully crafted self I choose to present. And then you meet somebody and you're like, uh huh? But <laughs> on Twitter, it's like, no, you have to like put like arterial blood into it. So like when I find I like people that I meet on Twitter, if I'm compelled to meet them from reading their tweets, than I have with previous social networks. I've stolen this trick from you, which is, if I don't get a certain number of retweets, I'm like, delete. Yeah, well, I mean... Because you're just like, well, why am I wasting people's lives forcing yeah. them to read these things that they're not enjoying? I do try to... Yeah, I cut my... T I'll cut them. If, it didn't, if people didn't respond, I get rid of it. Because yeah. it's also good for stand-up, because you, you have to be willing to kill your babies. Kill, yeah. And I don't mean human babies, but I mean the, your jokes. You can't be precious about stuff, and it doesn't land... I cut it. Yeah. Do people ever take? Because your, your, yours is my favorite Twitter feed, and I, uh, I think a lot of people's favorite Twitter feed. But I do Thanks. think it's so abstract at times. Are you ever confusing America? Like, do you ever get responses where people are like, "I, we are not, you know, we are not yeah. manatees, or you know, whatever." Yeah, response most would... people, you know, who pay attention to me, which I'm grateful that it's such a large number, you know, it, it is a big pile of people, but it's still a small percentage of the world. So if you choose to pay attention to my ramblings, then your mind is probably kinked in a similar fashion. So the people who follow me, you know, I do enjoy if I say something absurd or really satirical, like about the government and yeah. then... And, that gets retweeted, and then there are people who are like, "That's he. This boy's not sane. Yeah, help, help him or get rid of him. Do something because people shouldn't hear what he says." I like that. Do you think that? Do you think, are you followed by any Republicans? Oh, definitely. <laughs> because yeah. your your how would I describe your tweets towards the Republican Party? Uh, <laughs> bilious. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, they're very mean spirited, very funny, Thanks. very funny, the funniest. I can't, I find I can't retweet them <laughs> because I'm like, I don't want to deal with people tweeting, well, hey, Apper Biggs. Yeah. 
think think more about Benghazi. You know, yeah, like yeah, I can't yeah. have that be yeah my at feed all day. Well, like you mentioned Benghazi, and I think that's really why people came here tonight was to talk <laughs> about that. Here's the deal. What's funny about Benghazi? Nothing for good people. It's horrible. No question what happened there. There's no room for debate. But people's response to it and the way people have paraded these poor souls out and it's so awful and reprehensible. So when you make it, when you invoke that that like clarion call to bonkers, you know, conspiracy theory people, they can get really upset, which I find delightful. And I'm not, no, that's horrible. It's horrible when people die, unless they're like 98 and are like, I led a full life, I'd like to die now. Other than that, it's usually sad slash bad. And I would never make a joke about that, but I'll make a joke all day long about the way people try to twist other people's lives and tragedies to their own benefit. That's what humor is for first, and then distant second, third, anything else, I think. I believe they were 98-year-old soldiers. Oh, okay. That's what, I, yeah, okay. that's what I heard. Okay, that changes things. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, do you ever have this feeling, because I, I find my Twitter feed is like, I've tweeted, I realized the other night I tweeted, I've tweeted 11,000 things. Wow, that's like, a oh, lot And I'm like, oh, geez, things. like, if I ever had kids, mm -hmm. they'll never think, what is dad thinking? It's like they know mm. there's a stream of it. Yeah. I feel like that was like the guiding principle of my childhood is I was always like, what's dad thinking? Mm. Never says anything. Yeah. But with your kids, they're, they can just kind of... They're going to have some idea of what I think. Yeah, they're yeah. going to be able to, they're going to be able to like be like take 25 tweets and like triangulate them and apply yeah. them to any situation. They'll be like, well, he's probably proud that I did this, but you can tell he sort of wishes I had done that at that point, and so yeah. they don't won't even have to talk to me. And then I'll go cry in a cave. <laughs> <laughs> if your kids are ever like, what does my dad think about vaginas? Well, yeah. let me look here. <laughs> Do a Twitter search for mm. at Rob Delaney, vaginas. Even their oh. future, like, iPhone 23 <laughs> will explode from all the answers. So we're like, we can't handle this. 724 results. <laughs> <What>? Jesus. <laughs> I, uh, one of the things I noticed when I was reading your book is that you and I share a love of the book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, of the film mm -hmm. and book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I was thinking about it. I was like, is this... Round of applause for people, big fans of this film. Classic film. The, oh, maybe, is it, is, it, is it a comedian's film? Like, I was thinking about it today. I was like, why are we both obsessed with this film? And I was like, well, maybe because in a way all the patients are comedians, and Jack Nicholson is the ultimate, his character is the ultimate comedian, who's kind of, he's crazy enough to be there, but not so crazy that he isn't like, we should get out of here. First thing I wanna say is, I've, for the last four days, uh, I've been doing press all day, every day, yeah. and so I'm, I'm exhausted in a really kind of unique way. And I miss my children who are in California. So yeah. even thinking about that film, I'm already beginning to mist up. And I Aww. may cry just for 20 minutes uh, <laughs> talking about that film. Uh, this, that story, uh, you know, you've got a spirit. You've got Randall P. McMurphy as portrayed by Jack Nicholson in that film. And that film is perfect in every aspect mm -hmm. from the score to the tiniest extra to yeah. all, everything. Milo's Foreman, right? Milo's Foreman, yep. Milos Foreman. And uh, that is, you know, Randall P. Murphy, he's a spirit who, you know, rages against convention. And, uh, oh, here's a fun thing I didn't put in the book. When I was in the psychiatric, I, 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 if you read the book, you'll find out about 11 years ago, I was in, I was respond. I drove my car drunk into a building in a blackout and I went to jail and to rehab and to a halfway house. And, um, I was in the psychiatric hospital because I was in the chemical dependency unit of a psychiatric hospital. And I'm just like hanging out one day being like, man, I really got to get my life together. And, uh, and then Nurse Ratchet walked into the room. And when I say Nurse Ratchet, I mean Louise Fletcher, the actress who played Nurse Ratchet, just walked into a room that I was in while I was in a psychiatric hospital. And I like backed up against like the way like Linda Hamilton does in Terminator 2 when she sees Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'm like, <laughs> why? 
<laughs> and she was there because in real life, she's a nice person who was visiting somebody she knew who happened to be in the same hospital. And I definitely, I filled eight diapers on the spot. And then we had a nice talk. She was a very lovely woman because uh, Hollywood isn't real. But uh, right. just thought that was something that'd be that fun is to know. That's fascinating. <laughs> That's what she has to live with her whole life. Is yeah. That everyone thinks she's the most evil nurse. Yeah, and in, in fact, she's a, a good nice actress. Lady. Yeah, a yeah, nice yeah, a good person. actress, and she, <laughs> she did her job well. Yeah. yeah. There's something about that movie that is very evocative, though, in, in regards to, I think, comedy. I think the, the characters are funny. Oh, they're hilarious. Absolutely. They're genuinely funny. And Absolutely. They're, uh, and. and somewhat batshit. And humor is a coping mechanism for the horrors of the world. You know, you take painful things and you alchemize them into good things. You know, you take, you know, if tragedy plus time equals comedy, we're using comedy to is either the end goal and or the process to get to a smile when life is so difficult. Yeah. And these are people who are wrestling with life's problems. They don't know how to deal with them. And they're using the wrong defense mechanisms in some cases, or the wor or they're using the right ones, which is like, oh my God, life is so hard. And then they're like, well, why don't you go in a box, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, it, uh, it makes real sense to me that that movie appeals to comedians. Do you have a lot of people come up to you and ask about, uh, and kind of tell you their own personal demons because you open up to people so yes, much? Yes, I do. Yes. How's that go? I mean. I, the, well, the pro, I mean, the process is, like you said, they come up to me and say, hey, listen, you spoke about this, and I've been going through this, uh, you know, some variation of that. And uh, fine with me, because, you know, like getting through the alcoholism and the depression, which I talk about in this book, um, those are things that I barely survived. And the way that I su <clears throat> survived them was by accepting help, you know, using time-tested methods of endurance and surrender and love in various combinations, patience, the worst one of all to have to learn. <laughs> um, and so getting that toolkit sort of gradually revealed to me by other good people, it's just, it's my, my biggest life pleasure to be able to possibly share a kernel of anything that would ever make anybody, you know, make a good decision in their own life about their own mental health care or whatever. Yeah. So when people do that, I think, great, uh, my prayers are being answered. Yeah. A person, you know, it makes it, it makes it feel like there. comedy is an actual job. Yeah. And not just this frivolous thing. Yes. That we enjoy. Um, yeah, I was actually one of the things I really admired about the book is and I and I admire like about all of your writing is it, it's it's a you have a really strong point of view and you have a, you take strong stances on things. Like your point of view on alcoholism is firm. Like you're mm -hmm. not you're you're not psyched about it mm -hmm. you know you know it's a struggle yeah. and you know that it's you know you do th you can do things uh wh you know when you're drunk that are that are just abhorrible and mm -hmm. and i think i like that about your writing because i find a lot of comedies pov on alcoholism and drugs is cooler than that it's like we're cool yeah. We're, we're doing this, we're doing this, and it, you know, it appeals to people because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, yeah, but you're actually, you're, you take a pretty hard line on it, but not in a humorous way. Well, I, the thing is, I do it, I, the hard line is for myself. People talk about alcohol being cool because it's cool. It's fun. Right. Oh, my God. If you can party and have a good time, do it. Please have the best time. I know I can't, and the only way I know is because I tried for years and failed. Like, the time I finally quit 11 and a half years ago, was after many times of trying and only after my accident where I was like, oh, I'm a danger to the world at large, yeah. not just myself. Then I was like, I shouldn't drink. So, yeah. yes, I shouldn't drink, but should you drink? Really, probably. You probably should, yeah. you know? But I just I know, shouldn't, but yeah. these people okay, should. Okay, but you guys should, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> unless you shouldn't, but that's up to you. I have no, that's not up to me. We should take some questions. Did anyone raise their hand if they had a question they wanted us? Go ahead. Just raise your hand. We'll, we'll come to you with a mic. Oh, uh, this person, uh, the police are going to come over, and uh, <laughs> they're going to put a microphone on you, and then they're going to strap something to your asshole. <laughs> I have a question for both of you guys, if that's <laughs> okay. all right. With two different questions. So I understand, Rob, that you're a singer. That, like, sing. You used to sing yep. in, like, in Fenway Park and everything. Do you True. still sing? Uh, I sang the national anthem at Dodger Stadium a few months ago. So yeah, I, I, 
I like to do the Fenway and the Dodgers like once a year on average. Did you do Fenway too? Yeah, like wow. five times. Holy cow. Yeah, it's crazy. That is outrageous. It is outrageous. Wow. It's because I used to do musical theater. I went to NYU around the corner and I studied mm. musical theater. And, uh, and that's what I then, when I got out of college, I was decided, yeah, I'll do comedy instead. Uh, but I still know how to sing, ostensibly. There, you and I are both from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. There's, what is it about Massachusetts that there are so, so many comedians? Uh, you got Dennis Leary, you got uh, Stephen Wright, Eugene Merman, yep. Lenny Clark. I mean, this is like countless numbers yeah. of comedians. Do, what, do, do you have a theory on it? Do you ever think about it? I, you know, I don't know. What it's would it be? It's just the worst state. What would it be? It's a terrible and, uh, place. <laughs> I mean, it's a bad it's place. It's revolting, bad, bad people. and people des describe. It, I mean, it could be that it's what it's like to live there, and then there are comedians. It could be because it was like the first place to be like settled by European people when they came over. So maybe there's just the oldest buildings are there, and or maybe the Quabbin Reservoir, which is where Boston gets. Or maybe its they're water. just like rebellious people. Could be Paul Revere. Yeah. yeah, just trickled on down. It's cold. It's cold and it's hot in the summer. Like I live in LA now, yeah. and it's nice. And when I say nice, I mean it's like seventy-six degrees and sunny, yeah. three hundred fifty days a year. So, it, but it, then it, 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 so it's not hot. People think it's like summer there all the time. No, it's the nicest spring day there, yeah. and so, so uh, very soft now. Very, I'm from New Hampshire, so I know what mm -hmm. you guys are talking about. And yeah. then Mike. So Sarah Silverman. Yeah, yeah. And Adam big, Sandler and Seth Meyers. There we go. A lot of comedians in the Northeast. Um, and then Mike, I understand that you asked a significant other, maybe your wife, to a date on ch at church. True. Can you talk about that? <laughs> Can you talk about that decision? <laughs> I'm not going to steal focus. Because uh, that was, in, that was mean, in my book. No, it's uh, no. In my book, I talk about how I asked my college girlfriend to go uh, to church because it was like a change up. Like she kept mm -hmm. saying no to me asking her out, and so then I was like, "Hey, we should. There's a church on campus. <laughs> we should go to church. That'd be." And she just thought it was insane, and she's like, "Sure, I'll do that." Well done. Yeah. And, I then, you. and then that led to a really long relationship that ended terribly. I'm so sorry. So, yeah, I'd roll with that. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Raise your hand. Oh, go ahead. This gentleman's going to uh, put a microchip in your nipples. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask if you have anything uh, to say about working from home and making your own schedule uh, as a writer. Um, it's, it, it can be challenging, you know, so I try to, I like to get deadlines from magazines and publishers <laughs> and, uh, then go on the road. And so I guess since I do work from home, I try to work from home as little as possible and be, uh, told what to do and where to show up. So I, I, I mean, basically when I'm at home, I'm trying to get opportunities that aren't at home because uh, that can be hard. But when I do, a lot of this book I wrote using um, a couple different computer programs, one <laughs> called Mac Freedom, which just turns off your internet and you can't turn it back on. And then the other one is called- That's R called Mac Freedom? Yeah. Freedom Are you kidding? From your Mac. And, uh, and then the other one is called Write or Die. And basically, like I think it's like a flash window opens up on your screen, and you write within that. And if you stop writing, your screen will start to turn red. And if you don't resume writing, it'll start to delete what you've written. That's great no. for... No. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, irretrievably. Yeah, not like, oh, I hear, hit this to get it back. Gone. If you stop writing... For a few it seconds. It erases what you've written. Yep. And I love it. It's of course it's only for first drafts because then you got to go back and revise, you know. But it's a good way to just get the flow going, so you're not like, eh, why don't I write about, <laughs> you know? You're just like, I just gotta go! and then gradually good stuff starts. I mean, the first few things you're writing like chicken drum biscuit ween doodly doong doong, <laughs> and uh, then you start to write a real story. <laughs> so I, I love those things. So yeah, I trick myself. Definitely. Can you do a save as or something? Yeah, you can totally save part? it. Oh okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So, but it, what's it called? Write or die. It's called write or die. Dot com. Does anyone have this? Are these just these weird programs <laughs> that only Rob Delaney knows about? I mean, they're yeah, they're. Does I, anyone they're run, super cool. raise your hand? You do? You have that? 
You have write or die. It's just a website. But, okay. you know, then you put it on your computer. I mean, and le- that's a legitimate question and a good question because it's 2013, and if the same computer that you're going to write Moby Dick 2 on, you can also hit a button and then watch a lady take a shower, you know, why would you not do that? You know, so you have which, to... Which site is that? La- hu- Lady.showerhungary.net. <laughs> I love that site. Um, I was just checking if it's the same one I watch women take showers on. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah, they they got a few. And There's... the URLs are so catchy. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, how do you do you find it weird when you're on Twitter? I have this with my wife where like I'll be on Twitter and I'll think something and then laugh and then write it and then mm-hmm. she's like you can just also say that to me cuz <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Do you ever have that? Oh, definitely. Family? Yeah. I mean, I uh like my wife is cooler than any website I've yet Then to my discover. wife? No, 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 no. No. You're I wouldn't How dare gonna, you, uh, sir? <laughs> I didn't that's not what I said. But I uh here's the thing is yeah, that's true. It's important. You should have to use any computer or website as a tool, you know, and you don't want to use it to the to the distraction of your life, which we all do. I do. And other human people. So, yes, when your wife says that, she's a, being a better person than you, and you should listen to her. Just like when my wife says, how about you take that phone and jam it up your ass yeah. or throw it out the window? That comes from a good place within her. I hear it, and I'm like, come on. And then I'm like, you're correct, you know? So, yeah. So we, it's important to listen when people say that to us or to listen to our inner best self when it says, hey, put the thing down or close it and go smell a tree or pet a bee or whatever. I love smelling trees. <laughs> <laughs> I wish there were more trees in this city. We could smell them. Uh, what, you said there's a third program? No, you just, said there's just, just those, those two. two. Those are the only right two programs. Right or die. No other programs. <laughs> right or die, or die and freedom. And Mac freedom. Yeah. Mac Freedom, jeez. Yeah. Wow. Did so? How many Apple? Since we're at the Apple Store, how many Apple products went into making this book? Uh, th- two really. Two laptops because I wrote it on one, and then that one was like. You need two. Started. Started. You hear that, you guys? It just started to wheeze. You want to write a book? Two laptops. It was rather old and kind of got tired. So I wrote most of it on an older one and then started, get, went over to a new one. And then, then, like, literally the centerpiece, I had submitted the whole book to the publisher and then I was like, hey, wasn't there a 7,000 word story that I thought really <laughs> encapsulated the basic essence of my soul? Oh, yeah. And I had to rebuild the old computer search system just to find it. And then the publisher was like, yeah, it's, your book really would have been garbage without this. I'm glad you found uh-huh. it. Uh, raise your hand if you have another question. Go ahead. Sean? Our buddy Sean? Hey, guys. Uh, Rob, I, I know it took you a while to become honest with yourself. Mm-hmm. At, at, at what point, how and, and when did you become rigorously honest with your writing and be able to, to achieve a kind of honesty that, that a lot of us don't in our writing? Like uh, you, for example, <laughs> don't. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> I mean, I would say in the beginning uh, of doing stand-up, stand-up was very helpful for my writing of words on paper with my fingers. And I say that because in the beginning of stand-up, I used to do like more esoteric stuff where I'd like play characters and I'd talk like at subjects rather than, you know, I would talk more about like what's in the news or funny thing I read or whatever. And then... As the years went on, I started to realize that I got better, more enduring, stronger laughs when I talked more about myself, you know? And then, you know, more years passed, and then when I was like, what if I talk about that thing that I don't want to talk about, that when I talk about I start to feel like hot in my tummy, you know? Like, what if I talk about that? And then that started to get better. So I realized the more that I talked about the things that were, that the more my stuff could only come out of my mouth rather than somebody else's mouth. You know, that's why, like, on Twitter, I'm political a lot. In my stand-up, I'm not at all beyond the politics of, like, the personal or sexual politics or interpersonal, interfamilial, things like that. Uh, Because anybody can talk about, like, Obama, you know, or Kardashian, but only I can talk about, like, my parenting fears, you know, or my challenges within my marriage or things that I really, really care about. So, yes, it's scarier, but it's more rewarding 
and it's more dependable. So it's almost like it's scary, but then there's a more utilitarian, like, blue-collar aspect to it. Like, it also works, you know what I mean? It's like an amazing old tractor with, like, fewer engine parts or something rather than some newfangled skidabadoo that could break and explode because there's so many things, you know? That's where the metaphor starts to break down. <laughs> but what <laughs> oh, I'm saying, I was fully in it <laughs> all the way through. But I think that um, if a smart person edits what I said, then you, uh, what I'm saying is it took years. It was scary. And I'm very glad I did it. So that's I really answer. like on your website how you have advice for uh, aspiring comedians. I, well, yeah, enough people asked that I thought I did. I, I took it down, ultimately. Oh, did you I, take it down? I did. I, I'll put it back up. Um, not, that, not that you need it. Not that I don't scour. <laughs> Which, by the way, your film, uh, Sleepwalk With Me, is oh, such thanks. an indispensable... It's so realistic. My wife and I watched that together, like, holding hands, like, hurting <laughs> each other's knuckles. Because my wife was with me the whole way through. Yeah. You know, we've been together for a long time. And she was like, oh, my God. I mean, like, the net loss where you get paid less than the gas it takes to yeah. get there. I mean, oh, like that's what it's like. Yeah, that is what it's like. Uh, Sometimes it still is. Such a superb, such <laughs> a superb film. Um, so, so watch that film. And then... But uh, you took down the advice. The advice was so well written. Well, thank you. I remember oh, reading that up. and thinking like, oh, that's a really okay. beautiful piece. I I'll put it back up. But yeah, basically, uh, I, I think what I said is like, you know, maybe move to like New York, LA, or London yeah. to just slightly improve your odds. M take a class. Not because you'll learn anything in it, or but because mm -hmm. you'll be around other people who want to do comedy, mm -hmm. you know? the first My first TV writing job came from a guy I took an improv class with like, 12 years ago you know yeah. what I mean like that so that so just stack on, the deck in your on ridiculousness favor. on ridiculousness wow. on MTV yep and um, then what you know and then uh, and then work harder like look to your left how hard is that guy working work harder look over there how, how hard is she working work harder because it's also a war I'm of working attrition. harder than all these people right here but honest to god like here's a big ingredient people funnier than you people funnier like if you're whatever Scotty Pippen Michael Jordan is is like of comedy is gonna quit for some reason. He's not gonna have the work ethic or whatever, and then you'll get the job that he didn't get, even though he's funnier than you. And you'll you you have to like achieve peace with that as a comedian. That like endurance and work ethic, those are the people I admire. You know, natural talent, great, but unless you can build a skeleton in that goo pile of talent of hard work, then definitely quit last week. Someone writing down these metaphors. <laughs> Skeleton in the goo pile. <laughs> That's the name of my next I'm book. I'm on precarious psychic territory Skele after all the Skeletons the in the goo pile. <laughs> it's also a good band name. Uh, raise your hand. Go, uh, go ahead. Uh, this gentleman right here. Thanks. Uh, Mike had mentioned something about your sort of uh, adamant about your alcoholism, and mm -hmm. I can sure identify with that. Uh, I read, you know, I follow both you guys with the humor, and then when Corey Monteith died, I saw that, that piece you put up, and it was like so powerful, I still send it to people. And I read your stuff in The Guardian. Do you get people who, who understand all these different ways you write? I mean, the, the perspective, the seriousness, and then the absurdness. I always wonder that about you too, because yeah, and you have political writing, you have serious writing, you have comedic writing, absurd writing. Um, well, my the way that I feel about that is that for all my joshing around, um, and I can be sarcastic and stuff, and I can I can do things that come from like a small-minded place and a silly place. I really do, I like people and I love the human race and I really give them a lot more credit than, uh, you know, I think a lot of commercial things would or, 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 you know, or Hollywood or whatever. People are smart and they, un they appreciate nuance and I honestly think if you give people like a varied, nuanced thing or things, it's like watering a lawn. Like they are like, thank you. So people re generally, 
for the most part, when I do the disparate things that I do, people usually, if I like do like a big tonal shift in the middle of something, people aren't like, whoa, never mind. They're usually <laughs> like, oh, cool, pudding after my club sandwich. You know what I mean? It's like you wouldn't want your meal to just be, you know, cornbread. You also want cranberry sauce. So, um, and then, and then I just turn into a metaphor in front of you, and it, yeah. And then I eat it. Yeah. And then that's <laughs> but the you know, show. I think people are good. People are smart at, at the root. When you really like society, like the government wants us to all it literally wants us to divide us fifty fifty and have us fight each other so we don't pay attention to the things they're trying to put up our butts. And so, but that's wrong. People are wired to like each other. I mean, to see two little children, like I have two little children, my oldest kid is two and a half. To see him and my nine month old just, or just for the hell of it, be so kind to each other is like, I wanna throw, I wanna vomit tears projectile because I can't believe, it's just amazing. So people are, are good is my answer to your question about some different websites. <laughs> Two more, you got, go ahead. Hi, I'll direct this, in a, this question in, a, in Twitter format. At Rob Delaney, <laughs> you're cool, you are cool. Um, my fave tweets of yours are your Drake tweets. Kay. How do you select who you engage with? Hashtag 420, no, hashtag space Benghazi. <laughs> wow. Um, I think, yeah. I think standing ovation for that question. <laughs> Um, Didn't catch on, <laughs> but I like that question. It's very cle is clever. Yeah. It had a hashtag. Good stuff. Yes, it was um, a callback to your jokes. Not bad, huh? Thing had everything. Um, at Drake uh, was in it. <laughs> at uh, Leather Beef sixty nine. Uh, I the Drake, and then I'm gonna abandon the format. Um, I, the Drake stuff. I don't. know, He's just uh, silly. <laughs> Drake is silly to me. Uh, his, his music is good, but you don't think he could have just gotten at Leather Beef? You think he had to get Leather Beef sixty <laughs> nine? Uh, I, I, uh, Leather Beef is yeah. taken. <laughs> Imagine, and he it wasn't that he wanted to do sex number sixty nine. Yeah, yeah. It was like just, no, just one through sixty eight. You could get yeah, those are so taken. Like, you yeah, could yeah. get at Leather Beef seventy. Um, uh, no, Drake is just silly to me. Obvi obviously, he's good at what he does, but like, just how he's so mopey. I'm like, chill out. You were like a child star on a fun, you know, uh, what do you call that, soap opera for Canadian teens, and they were like, I'm sad because I'm so rich. I don't <laughs> buy it. So to me, he's a fun comedic target, even though I'm sure he's a terrific person, etc. Um, <laughs> So you enjoy those, yeah. Oh, and so then it's just fun. I mean, and nothing brings me greater joy than to think of the worst possible raps that I can think of and then earnestly send them to him and be like, why won't you put this on an album? Yeah, like that stuff. I mean, literally. Has he I ever will, replied? He never has. No, yeah. he hasn't. Counting Crows have replied and have been like, don't, why, don't make fun of us. And I'm like. Oh, do they say that? Oh, yeah. They yeah. are sad. And I'm like, I'm genuinely sorry and I feel bad and I didn't think that you would notice me. And I feel very, yeah. Oh, no, God. You could be the hugest celebrity and the billionaire in the world. And if you called me out, I'd be like, I didn't, I'm really sorry. Except Ryan Seacrest. Yeah, at Lena Dunham and I were tweeting at, <laughs> about uh, at, at each other about Maroon Five one night, uh -huh. and then like the drummer like chimed in and was like, "Hey, <laughs> we're trying our best." It was like uh, yeah. it ah! was it was really weird. That's just so weird about Twitter. It's just like it, this instant connection weird. across yeah. the world. That's so funny. That is so funny. Um, um, well, we have I think one time for one last question. Who has the best question? Who's, who's, who's going to ask a question that's going to make everybody go, that's the smartest person here? There's a blonde person over there. That, that person? Confident? Hi, Rob. Hi there, Nate. How often do you tweet something and then immediately regret it and worry about it? Um, maybe like once every two or three days is probably the honest answer. Like, I'll be like, that, whoa, you know? Or like <laughs> the, the, like the line between like satire and like the black 
carbon of the purest hatred on earth is like too thin for even me. I'm like, it's like diaphanous fabric. I'm like, I don't know. I think I just basically pooped in humanity's mouth. And then, I, so, so, but then people will be like, hey, terrific. And I'll be like, oh, okay, it's, I guess it's not that bad. Um, so, but that, that'll happen. And I'll totally delete stuff, you know, um, if I think like, because I remember like when I first was getting sober, I met a guy named Doug, this old guy, and he's like, he, he, and I, he, you just kind of learn how to rewire yourself, and he would, he would say like, well, before you say something, tough guy, he'd say like, is it true? Is it kind? And then he said, in the third one, a lot of people forget, he goes, is it necessary? You know? Hmm. He's like, and so I, t I ask myself that sometimes, not often when I tweet, but I'll be like, <laughs> did I need to do that? You know what I mean? Like, at, like, you could read a few of my tweets and think, this guy's a monster, he should be in a cage. Uh, but if you read like a hundred of them, you'd get a clearer picture and you'd be like, oh, he might not be a bad guy. He might, might possibly be trying to do something here. And so, um, so, but I do try to err towards the not mean. I might be angry. I think it's okay to get angry. There's plenty to be angry about. But the mean, destructive is uh, very rarely funny to me. So, so I do try to shy away from that. Like, and, and, and I'm my own favorite target, you know? So I'll say horrible things about myself. But uh, the world at large, I, I, I endeavor not to too much. But still, yes, every 48 to 72 hours, I tweet something and think, really shouldn't have done that. All right, so that's it. We're going to, just so you know, you can get this book if you have an iPad or a, a device, like, or a book. Physical, you can download physical, it onto a paper Hold that book. up so people <laughs> understand what that is. That's a book. That's a, pa it's in, pa it's paper. The, it's uh, printed on paper. And then also there's this other version, mm -hmm. which is on uh, the, the iPad or their computer, and you just buy it. You could iBooks. just buy it. It's iBooks. pretty visually satisfying. Uh, the first book I read on iBooks was my own, and it was a good way to consume it. They're, it's a pleasant uh, experience on your eyes. And, you, and you've been a pleasant experience on my eyes, Rob Delaney. And you on mine, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for coming out and joining us. Yeah. And tell all your friends about the book. Thank you, Mike. Huge privilege to have Mike Perbiglia oh, here. Thank you thanks. very much. And thank you, Apple and iBooks. Thanks so much. <laughs>